Now, with us here on stage is the honorary chairman of this conference, David Friedman, former U.S. ambassador to Israel. Now, you know, Ambassador Friedman may have completed his role as ambassador, but that was just officially. He's continuing as an ambassador around the clock for the sake of Israel and the U.S., and today he's also presenting his new project, One Jewish State. Shalom. Shalom. How are you? It's good. So, you know what? Let's start with that project, One Jewish State. What do you mean by saying that? It's, of course, against the two-state solution. Well, of course it's against the, uh, the two-state solution, but it's also what it's for. It's not just against. Um, after October 7th, when I heard, the first time I heard Joe Biden say, we need a two-state solution, I thought, that's it. We have to respond immediately. This, this, this is insane. This is so tone deaf. And, and especially when, you know, look, I was never in favor of a two-state solution. But, you know, we had a dry run, right? I mean, we had a dry run in Gaza. Uh, not a single Jew living there. Uh, not a single IDF soldier uh, on the ground there. Uh, billions of dollars being given to, uh, uh, whether it's from the United States, from UNRWA, from the EU. Uh, billions of dollars with a you know, Western-facing Mediterranean uh, seafront. And they took all the money and they, and they just either pocketed it or they built, uh, you know, terror tunnels or, or weapons. So. The, the, if you didn't, if you didn't, you know, if you were kind of teetering on a two-state solution before October 7th, anyone who's looking at this today has to understand there cannot be ever, under any circumstances, a two-state solution, and we have to fight it. But one of the claims, one of the claims are that the Netanyahu government, at least, is not uh, presenting an alternative, and that's right. where you come in. So this is, you know, again, I think it's important for us in America to help Israel, um, and to help, beginning with the political echelons in the United States, to help Israel grow more comfortable with the idea of Israeli sovereignty over Yudha Vashomron. I think it's important. And by the way, just, just to be clear, I'm not talking about sovereignty over Area C. I'm talking about Israeli sovereignty over the entirety of Yudha Vashomron. Okay. Now, what's but here's, here's the important point that I want to I want you to understand. You can support this. You can support this if you're on the right because you're happy about sovereignty. You can support this on the left if you think that Palestinians should have a better life. You can support this if you're secular because you just see it as the only way that Israel will ever have security. Or you can support this if you're religious and you think this is the land given by God to the Jewish people, as I do. But I'm saying the idea for Israel to have sovereignty over Yudava Shomron is a win-win. And we have to stop portraying it. It's being portrayed by most people, a lot of people in America, a lot of people in Israel, as a land grab. You know, that Israel's gonna take the parts that it likes, you know, we're gonna take Area C, and then we'll leave Area B, A and B to, they'll fend for themselves. And what that does, it just creates another Gaza, right, in a different location. Um, what we need to do is to expand upon the Abraham Accords, to go to our friends in the Gulf, and hopefully our new friends in the Gulf, and say to them, look, I know you keep talking about a Palestinian state as if it's something, you know that's not gonna work. We know that's not gonna work. Right, because there is a fear that at this point, Saudi Arabia may even condition the continuation, the, yeah, uh, the I, progress of the Abraham Accords with the Palestinian state, no? I, I gotta tell you, I don't, think th I don't think they want it. I think they understand what that means. It means another Gaza. It means another you know, 20, 30 years of war and violence and misery a lot of which could be exported back to Saudi Arabia. I don't think that's what they want. I think it's what America wants. I think it's what the Biden administration wants. And I think what they're doing is they're, they're hiding behind Saudi Arabia's you know, carrot of normalization as a way to get the Saudis to insist upon it. They don't want to insist upon it, they want the Saudis to. I, I'm not saying that you know, it's not something that the Saudis are, you know, are interested in talking about. It's got, it's got a good spin to their street. At the end of the day, everybody in the Middle East knows that a Palestinian state is a terror state. It, it's a rebirth of Hamas. It's a rebirth of the worst, the worst forces that, that confront not just Israel, but the other, the moderate Sunni nations as well. So, so how do you see the, the, the day after the war in Gaza? Well, look, the, the, the day after the war in Gaza, you know, I was just talking about this with the reporter earlier. There's not gonna be a day after the war. 
You know, it's not going to be like you're going to flick a switch and all of a sudden the war is over. Um, you know, Israel's destroyed about 20 out of 24 battalions, but destroying a battalion only means that you've, uh, you've killed more or have arrested more than half. Mm -hmm. You've destroyed the command and control. There's still hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of terrorists, you know, floating around the Gaza Strip. And there's four battalions in the south. So, you know, there may come a point when the military strategy changes, but we're talking about a radicalized population that, um, and they're getting no help from anybody. You know, when, when Syria had a civil war, uh, a million Syrian refugees were dispersed around Europe. They were all given a place to stay. Egypt will not take a single Ga uh, Gazan refugee. Jordan will not take a single Gazan refugee. Nobody wants them. So this idea about a day after, I said, make, you know, Give Israel some help. I mean, you know, what's, what does that mean a day after? Israel is the only country that, uh, that has an interest and an incentive and a capability of keeping Gaza from being radicalized again. I mean, no one else can. Who else is going to do it? It's, it's not going to be, it's not going to be, it's obviously not going to be Hamas. It's obviously not going to be the PA. It's not going to be the UN. The UN was supposed to demilitarize Hezbollah in 2006. UNIFIL is there, there today. And they still have 100,000, you know, miss missiles there, the second strongest army in the Middle East. So these, you know, whether it's the UN or the EU or, you know, uh, or any of these Arab countries, they, it doesn't work. Now, how, how do you see the other issues of uh, pressures coming from the United States about Rafa, about ending the war, about this deal that we're talking about now? Some say it's just the politics, but this deal, for example, we, according to reports, also Netanyahu is already uh, agreeing to this deal. How do you see those reports about the deal? I think the pressure Biden is putting on Netanyahu right now is extraordinary. I think that what he did on Friday, when he announced an Israeli proposal at a time when it was Shabbat in Israel and Netanyahu wasn't even supposed to respond to it, he ended up responding. But, you know, I mean, forcing Israel to respond after it was already Shabbat, a proposal that Israel never made, or certainly leaving out the, the critical piece of it, which is that Hamas uh, will be destroyed, right? I mean, he left out that, that, that relatively important, you know, aspect of the deal. I think the pressure is tremendous, and I think that Netanyahu is, uh, is being confronted also um, by, by America and others with this false choice that you can either win the war or free the hostages, but not both. And, and I've never understood that conflict, especially when you're dealing with Hamas. I mean, look, look you know, I, I, I cry. I cry for the hostages. I also cry for the soldiers who've lost their lives. I mean, everybody is suffering in this country. And as far as I can tell, the way to get the hostages back is to put the maximum amount of pressure on Hamas. I, think, I don't think these are, these are conflicting goals. Now, people try to say it's only because of the elections that Biden is doing this, and Biden is saying that. Maybe that's not true. Maybe this is just the policy that is totally opposite of the policy of the current government in Israel. Look, the, um, if you understand the architecture of the White House, you would know that you have the Oval Office over here and down the hall is the National Security Council. Mm -hmm. right? That is the president's personal advisor you know, on security. They have a huge amount of influence. The number two guy, the number two guy in the National Security Council uh, advising on the Middle East is a guy by the name of Maher Bitar. He is one of the founders of Students for Justice in Palestine. All right? That's, that's the guy who is down the hall from the Oval Office. So if you want to, look, look, you know, we, we go back and forth, you know, we're, we're, we're a, we're a we want to we wanna believe the best about people. Um, I don't think it's fair to criticize Joe Biden personally because I'm not sure, I'm really not sure. I'm not sure that he knows what he's doing. I'm really not. I think that, I think that he's under the influence of, of Tony Blinken. He's under the influence of Jake Sullivan, under the influence of Maher Bitar, under the influence of Hadi Amar, who runs the Palestinian office uh, that we never had in, uh, in the embassy. And they, are, um, they believe in the two-state solution as the, as the mother's milk mm -hmm. of American diplomacy. And they believe that Netanyahu is, uh, is, against, is against everything they want. And, and they're going to gonna push him out. They are. That's, that's all they want to do is push him out, beginning with Chuck Schumer and continuing with this entire administration. So finally, uh, regarding the elections, you believe that Trump is better for Israel, despite that there's, there are fears in Israel 
according to which some are saying that maybe he was good then, but with Trump you never know. It could be that now he'll feel that he owes Arab states or even the Palestinian Authority something, that it wasn't coming from his ideals, rather his, that's what he felt was right then. People are afraid that with Trump you never know what's next. Well, look, that, we had that exact conversation in uh, September of 2016. Exact conversation. And I was there and I was, you know, I said, look, um, first of all, I mean, I want to say something that, first, I think he'll be, I think he'll be much better, not, not, even, not even close. But I also, I also believe strongly in the, in the words of King David, you know, al tivatachu b'nedivim. I mean, we don't trust in princes, okay? Israel has to trust itself and protect itself. And that's the most important thing. I, 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 I think, I, I believe, in a Trump administration, we're going to see the following policy. Um, he's going to say that Israel is going through enormous trauma right now. They've got to deal with their problems in the south. They've got to deal with the problems in the north. They've got to deal with Judea and Samaria. They've got to deal with internal political issues that have never been you know, more acute. They've got to deal with the issue of Haredim in the army. They've got a lot, a lot of issues, right? And Trump's position is going to be there's no way I know better than Israel about what's best for Israel. Okay, that's it. So, this is our most important ally in the region, and maybe a most important ally in the world. I'm going to support Israel diplomatically. I'm going to support them economically. I'm going to support them militarily, not with my soldiers, but with, with my ammunition, whatever they need. And I'm going to help them make the decisions for themselves. I'm not going to send people into the war cabinet. I'm not going to show up every two weeks, sit in the war cabinet, you know, Blinken and, uh, and uh, Sullivan, neither one of which has ever fought in a war. Well, in the beginning, it seemed like a great gesture. You're saying that was basically... No, no, no. The, the gesture was when Biden came early. I thought mm -hmm. that was a good gesture. After that, when uh, these guys show up every couple of weeks and they start, you know, getting into the war cabinet, this is the most you know, sophisticated, complicated ground warfare in the history of the world. You know, Hamas has the greatest home court advantage of ground warfare in the world. Okay, how they got there, a lot of, you know, there's a lot, of, yeah. a lot of fault that could be raised for that. But that's what they were. And what they're going to, the only thing they're trying to do is to convince Israel to kill fewer Gaza civilians at the expense of more Israeli lives. That's all they're doing. And, 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 and I'm sorry that they kept coming, and I think if they would have left Israel alone, the war would have been over four months ago. And we'd be talking about something else, unfortunately, but that's not what we are. And that's what should be next, uh, then, as Trump comes in? What? And that's what you're hoping, you're promising that will happen when Trump comes in? Oh, I don't make promises no for Donald Trump. I mean, that's, I, that, that I don't do. Um, we know each other a long time. We've worked together very closely on the Israel file mm -hmm. for four plus years. I've spoken to him recently. Mm -hmm. I know his views, and I, I believe the most important thing about him here, he does not have a nuanced view about who are the good guys here and who are the bad guys here. Not at all, okay? He knows who are the people who are fighting, you know, to save their country and those who are enemies of Israel and equally um, enemies of America. Ambassador David Friedman, Honorary Chairman of the Jerusalem Conference, thank you very much. I call